Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's live webinar, Third Trimester Obstetric Scans, Essential Point of Care Ultrasound Exams for Instant Answers. I'm Janez Castelgate, VP at Clarius. We're seeing growing adoption of point of care ultrasound, or POCUS, for obstetric examinations. It provides the ability to make a quicker and more accurate diagnosis at the bedside than can be made with palpitation and Doppler alone. Handheld ultrasound is also more portable and affordable than traditional machines, bringing efficiencies to the busy obstetric practice. Also used in family and primary care practices, emergency departments, and amongst midwifery groups, wireless ultrasound is now bringing high definition imaging to the expecting patient's bedside and used as an extension of the physical examination. In October, ultrasound expert, Dr. Fred Yushikov presented Essential's second trimester POCUS scans. If you missed it, it's available on our website to watch on demand. In today's live event, we're pleased to be introducing you very shortly to expert guest speaker, Dr. Yoriki DeHawk, who will take us into the third trimester and show us essential exams for your expecting patients. But first, I want to welcome everyone who joined us today from all corners of the world. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to your host. Today, we bring you an all-female cast. Shelley Gunther is an experienced sonographer and recently joined us as clinical marketing manager at Clarius. She has over 25 years of experience as a clinical ultrasound expert with extensive experience in both general ultrasound and echocardiography. At Claris, Shelley is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice, delivering practical webinars like today and tutorials for our Claris classroom, which now feature over 100 on-demand videos. Please join me in welcoming Shelley. Hi, Shelley. Hi, Janice. Thank you very much. Um, so since I joined Clarius in the fall, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. DeHawk shortly thereafter in a classroom video uh, taping. And I was excited to see how point of care ultrasound is really expanding into obstetric care. You know, historically we've only seen it used by radiologists and sonographers in hospitals or imaging clinics. But with the scanners becoming more available and portable and more affordable for sure, it's great to see how POCUS has fast become an, an extension of regular cl clinical practice and is often a profound impact on patient care. We found a great article in preparing for this webinar. It's an up-to-date review article that speaks to um, the impact point of care ultrasound in both general practice and obstetrics and gynecology. We know that POCUS is different from conventional obstetrical ultrasound in that it's typically a quick, limited, focused study performed in the clinician's office or at the bedside and is performed to answer a specific clinical question. The POCUS is very well suited to time critical scenarios as well, depending on the situation, the course of treatment and the results of therapy can be observed with ultrasound at the clinician's discretion and in a timely manner, which isn't always the case when having to wait for an appointment at an imaging center. The beauty of POCUS is that it's performed by the same clinician who is making treatment decisions. The, that physician has the advantage of knowing the patient's background, the symptoms, and is able to tailor the ultrasound exam to suit each situation. And so point of care ultrasound really can be considered a routine extension of regular clinical practice. For most obstetric cl clinicians, it can give immediate answers to what could sometimes be life-threatening situations. The literature describes really high specificity and sensitivity in point of care scans. And in obstetrics, ultrasound can be used to monitor the course of any pregnancy from five weeks all the way to term. Obstetricians and midwives can use point of care ultrasound to confirm intrauterine pregnancy, fetal viability, the number of fetuses and gestational age. And then there can be monitoring of the pregnancy in the third trimester to assess fetal lie and growth, fetal well-being, as well as placental position and determine the level of amniotic fluid, which if too low or too high can indicate various pathological uh, conditions. These are all things that Dr. DeHock will be describing in more detail later. And something near and dear to my heart is the introduction of portable and more affordable ultrasound systems allows for better ultrasound access to more obstetrics departments and potentially remote and rural regions. Speaking from experience, I've worked as a locum sonographer in remote areas of the country and it really pains me to see the lack of access to ultrasound for people living in these communities. I look forward to a world where pregnant patients, regardless of where they live, can get immediate reassurance that their babies are okay. In fact, this review article states that in general practice, OB ultrasound is one of the most common ultrasound scans performed. 
So this webinar should be very informative to a wide variety of clinicians who uh, care for pregnant people. And publications on point of care ultrasound show that the diagnostic findings obtained with these portable systems are similar to those we see on the larger CART-based systems in very specific clinical contexts. This indicates to me that while we really don't sacrifice image quality and thus patient care with small handheld scanners. So before we get into our presentation today, I'm really interested to learn from the folks all over the world and from different walks of clinical practice, um, what challenges do you face in your practice when you're uh, limited to just physical exam only? Um, is it broad differential diagnosis? Is it a misdiagnosis? Is there a missed abnormality? Is it just um, that there are unanswered questions, un unclear progress of therapy, or patient anxiety? So we'll just give this a few minutes to answer the poll questions. Great, so we can see there's, it's kind of across the board here, but uh, you know, unanswered questions is, is a big one and patient anxiety is, uh, is definitely up there as well. Um, so this is great. Uh, these are uh, things that uh, definitely we've discussed with Dr. DeHock before as well. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. DeHock. Um, she's a clinical professor in the ob gyne department. Um, here in BC, and she completed her medical school and a master's of science in clinical epidemiology at the University of Calgary, did her residency training in ob gyne at the University of British Columbia. Now she provides care at her clinic here locally and at two uh, large local hospitals as well. Um, and she's also very dedicated to the study um, and treatment of lower, lower genital tract diseases at the uh, BC um, Center for Vulvar, Vulvar Health. So I'll hand it over to you, Dr. DeHock, um, and you can tell us all about how you use ultrasound in the third trimester. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shelley, and hello to everybody joining us today. I'm very pleased to be here. So I have used a point of care ultrasound in my practice for quite a few years, and I have found it to be a very invaluable tool. Um, POCUS certainly has become more accessible and more portable in recent years, which has made it even easier to use, which is very exciting. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to be here to speak about the use of POCUS in obstetrics, particularly in an office-based setting, um, and provide some demonstrations for useful scans that we can do at the bedside in the third trimester. So just a little bit about myself, I have a general OBGYN practice, as well as a subspecialty gynecology practice focusing on lower genital tract disease. My obstetrical practice includes both primary care, as well as high risk and consultative obstetrics. So lots of uses for POCUS ultrasound. Today, I'd like to cover a brief introduction to what POCUS is. We will review POCUS applications in obstetrics, discuss some benefits and limitations of POCUS in obstetrics, and review POCUS techniques and some practical um, strategies for scanning in the third trimester. So point of care ultrasound refers to an exam method in which the ultrasound is brought to the patient. So it becomes essentially an extension of the physical exam. We are able to obtain real-time or instant images that directly correlate with a clinical question we may have or with the patient's presentation. When we compare point-of-care ultrasound with conventional ultrasound, we know that it is more rapid, it is more compact and more portable. This makes it easier to use and integrate into a busy practice. Focus excels at answering a specific diagnostic question. So essentially we are doing a limited study at the bedside. The scan is usually performed by the same clinician who is making treatment decisions. And this is a big advantage because the clinician knows the patient's background, symptoms, and can integrate this information seamlessly into their ultrasound study. In general, there is limited research available in regards to the use of POCUS in obstetrics, but what we do have shows relatively high specificity and sensitivity for POCUS in OBGYN. And the application of POCUS can be extended across all of the trimesters. 
So in the first trimester, depending on the gestational age, with our transabdominal probe, we may be able to confirm an intrauterine gestation, fetal viability. We can determine the number of fetuses and the gestational age. Of course, as a, if a pregnancy is very early, very early on, a transvaginal ultrasound may be required. In the second and third trimester, uh, POCUS ultrasound has significant use uh, into, in um, confirming fetal viability, measuring the fetal heart rate, confirming the position, assessing placental location, measuring amniotic fluid, uh, and measuring fetal biometry. Point of care ultrasound in obstetrics is relevant to anybody who is providing care for pregnant uh, patients. So this includes providers of urgent care uh, um, for pregnant women, obstetricians, family physicians, emergency room physicians, midwives, nurse practitioners, uh, as well as nurses. Benefits that I have found uh, and that are described in the literature for point of care ultrasound in obstetrics include that it is um, number one for me accessible. It is compact and convenient and therefore I can easily incorporate it into my practice. Um, it also provides timely information for issues that may unexpectedly arise during pregnancy um, and allows us to expedite appropriate management accordingly. Uh, POCUS certainly has enhanced my confidence in clinical decision-making in certain situations. Um, and most importantly, there are many times I have been able to quickly reassure patients in a timely fashion, um, thanks to having the bedside ultrasound uh, relative, re readily available. So it really um, is nice for relieving patient anxiety. In regards to limitations of POCUS, um, this would include the fact that the images are provider dependent. Therefore, so are whether those images are relevant or diagnostic. So there is potential for an error in imaging or interpretation of that imaging um, that could result in harmful patient management. Uh, currently where I work at least, there are no educational standards or guidelines around the use of POCUS. And definitely as this area expands, something that is needed. Okay, let's get on to some scanning. Um, so here are the exams that I personally find um, the most useful in the third trimester. So looking for fetal cardiac activity, um, determining fetal lie and presentation, locate, locating the placental position and taking fetal biometry measurements. We can also share video clips or photos with the patient um, with ACT-1. So you can see a beautiful profile view here on the screen. Dr. Dehock, do you find you're using ultrasound on all of your patients or, or just a select few? Yeah, so I, I don't routinely scan all of my patients, but there are certain times that I do scan all patients. So I routinely do a position check at 35 to 36 weeks, which I'll get more into in the position section. Um, so although I don't use it for every patient, I find myself using it multiple times a day when appropriate. So in regards to setup, this is how I like to position things. Um, the patient is supine uh, and should be properly draped. I usually protect their clothing with a uh, sheet so I don't get ultrasound gel on everything. Um, you can use the Clarius with your phone or you can use it with a touchpad. Um, I like to use it with an iPad and we have it mounted on a mobile cart. So I position the screen to the right of the patient um, so that the screen can face both of us and the patient really enjoys being able to observe the exam. I scan with my right hand and then I use my left hand to manipulate the screen. Um, I'll either sit or stand um, while scanning. So the first technique we'll discuss is uh, taking a fetal heart rate. Um, so this is of course essential uh, to confirming viability. Um, in instances where it may be challenging to find the fetal heart rate with the DOP tone, uh, it is particularly helpful to have the ultrasound handy. Um, and so some common times that you may, found, may find that you struggle finding the fetal heart rate with the DOP tone alone is if you're uncertain of the fetal lie or position um, in patients with an elevated BMI, if there's an anterior placenta and you're getting a lot of interference, um, or if you're scanning twins or other multiples, this can be really helpful. So the ultrasound allows us for a quick and easy identification and reassurance uh, in, this, in these situations. Um, in the second and third trimester, we can uh, clearly see the four chamber heart with ultrasound, which helps us with fetal heart rate detection. 
So in regards uh, to the technique that we use, um, we want to be in M mode, which stands for motion mode. Um, we acquire a nice four chamber view of the heart, which is usually done with the transducer in a transverse position. And then we want to optimize our magnification so that the fetal heart rate takes up most of the screen. And then we'll place the calipers um, over an area of cardiac activity to create a cardiac cycle. And then we'll use the fetal heart rate function uh, tool to measure the fetal heart rate. So um, let's say that we have a prime up who comes to our office at 36 weeks and she's worried about decreased fetal movement and we want to um, in, uh, reassure her. So we're going to scan and obtain a fetal heart rate. So let's review the technique. So I routinely start scanning suprapubically. Um, for me, that gives me an instant sense of the position of the baby. Um, so here we can see the bright bones of the cranium. Um, from there, I determine what side uh, the thorax is on. And so from there, I will um, locate the fetal heart. And then once we have a nice view of the fetal heart, which we have there, I will switch to M mode, obtain the calipers, and then try to get the nice cardiac cyclograph, which I have there. So I freeze, and then I use the fetal heart rate measurement tool for, to measure from trough to trough or peak to peak. And the fetal heart rate in this patient is 136 beats per minute. So right away, we can reassure her um, regarding the fetal heart rate. It must be such a nice thing for the patients because I know scanning in a clinic, it, you know, they, they're, they're all up in arms because they've already seen their doctor and they can't find the heart rate or the heart uh, sounds with a dop tone. And so by the time they get to us, they're, they're just a mess. And, and you know, so it, it's really nice to be able to offer that to them right away. Yeah, absolutely. It saves the patient a lot of anguish and anxiety if we can give them that reassurance right away. So on to the next technique, which is uh, determining fetal lie and presentation. Um, so fetal lie refers to the relation of the baby uh, in regards to the maternal access. So fetuses will generally um, assume a longitudinal lie, um, but they can also be transverse or oblique. Um, but like I said, long longitudinal is the most common. Um, fetal position refers to which part of the baby is presenting to the pelvic inlet. So in the second trimester, it's less important because the position is variable. Um, but by the end of the third trimester, we want to confidently know what is presenting in regards to delivery planning. So the most common position for a baby to be in is vertex. And then the second most common would be breech, but we can also sometimes get other positions such as shoulder presentation. So this, Shelly, is one time where I would routinely scan all of my prenatal patients at 35 to 36 weeks. Most of the time we're able to know fetal position just by our palpation or Leopold's maneuvers, but there certainly have been some times where I've been surprised to diagnose a breech baby around this time. Um, and the benefit is that I've made the diagnosis with enough time to expedite uh, patient management um, and arrange that in a timely fashion for these patients. So a simple method uh, by which we can determine fetal position is um, to look sagittally at the, at the lower uterus to see which part is presenting. So in the diagram on the top, we can see the head or the vertex is presenting versus the bottom, the bum uh, is presenting. So that's the breech baby. Um, alterna alternatively, as I suggested, you can also um, scan transverse suprapubically to determine which is presenting and then determine fetal life from there. So in this example, I'm scanning transversely just above the um, uh, pubic bone. Um, I can see that right away that the baby is vertex. And so if that, were the, if that were the purpose of your exam, you could finish there. I'm looking to see which way the uh, baby is lying. So I'm scanning to the maternal right here. We can see the thorax and the spine to the maternal right. I'm scanning um, up towards the body. This baby is in a vertex position with a longitudinal lie. So we are able to determine that quite quickly.
And I'm just scanning across and you can see the feet there. So placental evaluation. So usually we can see the placenta quite well transabdominally by the beginning of the second trimester. It usually will have a fairly uniform echogenicity um, as well as thickness and the cord will usually insert centrally. Um, these are all features we can quickly look for on bedside ultrasound. Um, as is the position of the placenta, which typically, typically can be anterior, posterior, bundle, or a combination of those. In a patient who's presenting um, with bleeding, for example, it may be helpful to evaluate for a low placenta. Um, there's a few different types that this could be. So a placenta previa is a placenta that's completely covering the internal os versus a marginal placenta, which is a placenta that extends to the edge of the internal os or a low-lying placenta. So the edges within two centimeters of the os. If we suspect a low-lying placenta, then we would want to confirm with a transvaginal ultrasound or a more formal ultrasound. So here we're locating placental position. So I'm scanning and right away I could see the placental edge anteriorly. You can see it very nicely right here. It's not low and it's not near the cervix. So we know we have an anterior placenta in this case. So in terms of fluid assessment, how I like to do it in my office is I will routinely look at fluid in the third trimester. And if it looks subjectively low, then I will take a measurement. I find the deepest vertical pocket or DVP the most amenable to bedside scanning. You can also do an a a v uh, AFI, which is a measurement of fluid in the four pockets. Um, I find it a little bit less amenable to focus because it takes a little bit longer, but you could still do that. Um, polyhydramnios refers to too much fluid, so greater than eight centimeters, versus oligohydramnios, which is too little fluid or less than two centimeters. Um, and normal is between two to eight. So here I am scanning through. And I'm looking for a nice fluid pocket. I know the baby's on the right hand side. So I'm going to look in the left upper quadrant. And there I've got a nice, beautiful pocket. So I'm, I'm pausing there. And then I'm using my calipers to measure in the vertical plane and ensuring that that measurement is between two to eight centimeters. So very quickly, I can determine that the fluid in this patient is adequate. And are you, are you looking to measure where there is you know, no fetal limbs or cord or anything like that? Yeah, that's right. So typically we want um, an area that has no fetal parts and no umbilical cord. Great. Excellent. So here again, so, we're, so typically we'd like to scan from left to right in the sagittal view um, to estimate where our DVP may be. And then we use the calipers in a vertical orientation. So fetal biometry measurements, I find a little bit more challenging and I find that I do this less often in the office. Um, we rely on our more formal detailed ultrasound or a growth scan um, that's done at the, um, you know, through the hospital for our accurate growth measurements. But certainly uh, POCUS has the ability to take, um, to um, do the fetal biometry measurements. So you can measure the biparietal diameter, head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length, which we'll demonstrate a little bit today in our live demonstration. So just an example of the BPD. So this is a transverse view of the fetal head at the level of the thalami. Um, we should see the um, midline falks, the thalami, and the septum cavi pellucidi. And the caliper um, should measure perpendicular to the midline falks. And the top caliper is usually outside the parietal bone versus the bottom, which is with it. Um, and so then when we're finished our exam, if we're taking some photos a little or little clips, uh, video clips as we go, um, we can actually choose a selection of images that we can send to the patient. So here's just an example of that. So this is our patient at 36 weeks. We've done scanning for the fetal heart rate, the fetal position, we've looked at fluid. Now I can actually go through and determine which pictures the patient might like to keep. We can select them. And then we obtain the patient's contact information or email address, as well as their consent. And then we can actually send them to the patient for, um, for keeping and um, making mementos or whatever they'd like to do with it.
find that really nice rather than just taking home a little piece of thermal paper. <laughs> yeah, or sometimes patients will try to take a photo of the screen or something like that. Right. So then they, they can have these um, on their phone or on their computer and share them. Perfect. So in conclusion, um, I find that uh, portable ultrasound scanners are a really practical and helpful tool in obstetrics. Um, they provide me with real-time answers and rapid detection, as well as patient reassurance and reduce anxiety. Um, I do think that there's a role for training and accreditation and quality assurance of focus, which we'll hopefully see as this field becomes more popular. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawk. That was excellent. Lots of good information there. Now, we'd like to encourage everyone watching to use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom to ask any questions at all that uh, may have come to mind during the presentation. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to do a quick live demonstration. Um, uh, I have a lovely model here. She's not quite in the third trimester, but pretty close. Um, yeah, so we'll do a, a live demonstration of uh, some of the things Dr. DeHawk spoke about, and she can kind of walk me through the technique. So we're going to do kind of a determination of, of the fetal lie and, and placental position here. So I just uh, have the uh, scanner in a transverse position, just super pubically, and we can already establish that the baby's head is down. Mm, and, yeah, you can uh, see that you can see that instantly, which is great. Really nice, yeah. Yeah, and mobile. <laughs> Still really busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to slowly, staying in the transverse position, start scanning um, toward the fundus, and uh, I just decrease, decrease, increase my depth a little bit here. Sorry. And so, yeah. So we can see, just slowly scanning upwards here. Looks like baby's fairly midline there. Yes, yeah. yeah. So longitudinal of vertex and in the midline, there's the, there's the fetal heart, yeah. you can see that beautifully. Shall we take a fetal heart rate here? Sure, yeah. So what I can do with uh, one of the new features with the new scanner and the new app um, is something called uh, HD zoom. And so it gives us a really nice high definition um, zoom image. This baby's face down, so I'm not gonna get the beautiful, oh, there she, she's gonna move around for us. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go into this HD zoom feature and it actually lets us select a region of interest um, that we can kind of do a, a, a right zoom and get a nice high definition image of the heart. And uh, so there we can, oh, mm -hmm. the rolling target. <laughs> target, yeah. There we can get a nice good look at the heart here. You can see the valves, I'm getting shadows from the ribs here, but. So then from there, I can go into the M mode and we can just make sure that, that our line is over a moving target here. And we're just looking for a nice um, motion picture on the um, mm -hmm. on the M mode. So from here, I'm going to go into my measurement tools, and there's a little fetal heart rate icon, and I'm just going to uh, place my calipers kind of from one peak to one peak. Great, and I'm getting about 132 beats per minute. That's great, which is normal. Perfect. So I'm just going to go back to B mode. We'll get out of the zoom uh, feature right now. Good. And so now I can just kind of continue scanning up toward the fundus. There's baby's bladder. Legs. Legs. Good. And all the way up to the top, we're still we seeing can a little see bit. The, we can see a little bit of placenta there too. Right. Yeah, so placenta looks like it's posterior. Great. And then I can just come all the way back down again. Let's have another look, baby stomach and to the heart. And then we're just back. So definitely head down and, and there's no placenta um, that, that I'm seeing between the os and the, um, and the baby's head. Mm -hmm. Should we do a, um, a deepest vertical pocket, shall we? Sure, yeah. So, so we'll try gonna... to find an area of fluid that doesn't have uh, moving baby parts or umbilical <laughs> cord in it. All right, so I'm just going to have a little look around there. Oh, there's a nice cord, cord there. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just go over this way. Maybe we can, there's a nice pocket there. And okay. so I'm, I'm just trying to stay um, uh, very perpendicular um, to the uterus, just so that we're not overestimating the, the fluid. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to freeze. I'm just going to back up at just a couple of frames here because baby jumped in just at the last minute. And I'm just going to do just a simple 2D measurement here, just a distance measurement from the anterior uterus to the uh, 
to the placenta here and we're getting almost five almost yeah. five centimeters which is great very normal perfect great um and then i wonder shelly because i didn't demonstrate it in my presentation maybe we can show doing a few fetal biometry measurements yeah you bet yeah so i'm going to just i kind of tend to go with what's easiest first um, i don't fight these little people because they always win <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to start with a femur which is which is very obvious and right at the top and as soon as it stops moving i'll I'll freeze my image. I can back up a few frames here. So again, I'll go into the measurement tool. I'll go back into the obstetrics package. We'll just measure the femur from end to end, and I can just make some fine tuning adjustments here. And uh, Melissa said she has a very tall husband, so baby's got long legs. So measuring about a week over, so 26 weeks, four days. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just head kind of south here to the abdomen. And what I'm looking for is the um, a nice cross section through the baby's belly here the fetal stomach and the um, umbilical artery here. And mm -hmm. uh, so we'll get, we want a nice round picture uh, because we're measuring the circumference here. So I'm just gonna go select the uh, abdominal circumference tool. And I like to start at the back, go to the front, and then we can just quickly make some fine tuning adjustments with our, with our calipers here. And again, we're getting right where we should be. Perfect. And we'll just head down towards the head. And baby hasn't been super cooperative with the head yet, but I think we're, we're, we can get a pretty good look here. So again, we want the midline of the brain to look like it's in the midline. <laughs> and I'm just gonna try and get the, uh, the thalami, which are gonna be right here. And the cavum septum pellucidum in the front right here. And we will freeze our image. It's not perfect, but for demonstration purposes, I'll, I'll take it. So a biparietal diameter here. So outer skull to inner skull. And then as well, we can do a head circumference just the same way we performed the abdominal circumference. Some fine tuning adjustments here, good, great. Good, and so all the measurements are, are right in the ballpark of where we should be. And again, if, if I get, there's a nice little little face picture. Oh, there's an arm up in front of the face mm -hmm. right now, but yeah. we'll see if we can get a nice little profile. Oh, there's a face. Great. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I can take that. And then um, like you mentioned, we can select that image um, and send it off to the, um, uh, with the act one feature. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that way, Melissa will have a cute little video. So I will do that later because I'm gonna try and get you some better images too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you can also see the growth parameters nicely in the- Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we summarized in, there. Yeah, we can go into the, into the uh, measurement package, very comprehensive, uh, average gestational age, which is showing right here, and the estimated fetal weight, given that we did all of the uh, measurements um, mm -hmm. And if we've done more than one measurement, the system will average for us. So um, all I did was I punched in the estimated due date. We knew that from her uh, 20 week ultrasound. And uh, so that we can compare gestational age to, uh, to um, uh, ultrasound age. Perfect. Excellent. That's great. Good. Good. So in a, you know, in a really quick amount of time, we've, we've, we've got a lot of information and uh, such a great exam to be able to do in the doctor's office. Good. So I'm going to hand things back to Jeunesse now, just prior to getting your questions. Um, and again, just feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. I have to say that was so much fun. Thank you, Shelley, for the dynamic <laughs> live demo using our new Clarius third generation of the Clarius C3 wireless ultrasound scanner. And thank you so much, Dr. DeHawk, for sharing all your ultrasound exam techniques with us to monitor mother and fetal health throughout uh, the third trimester. Before we begin our live q and I'd like to take a minute to invite you to learn more about our Clarius HD3. So before we open up the floor to question, here's a quick question for you. We'll open up this poll um, so that you can learn about bringing Clarius ultrasound to your practice. Um, 
So please go ahead and select any of the options that you see here. Pricing does vary uh, as well as availability by region. So please do let us know if you'd like to receive a quote and pricing information for your region. You may opt to speak to one of our uh, experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your practice. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action. And we can send you more video tutorials for obstetrics, like the ones that you saw today that were highlighted in the presentations. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. While you do that, I'll take a minute to tell you more about our newly released Clarius C3 HD3 wireless scanners that you saw in the live demo, and also our Clarius EC7 HD3 endocavity wireless scanner for early OB examination and gynecology. Just like our full family of products, these Claris HD3 scanners deliver the highest definition ultrasound imaging in a wireless and easy to use system. Available in select countries, Claris HD3 scanners are now 30% smaller and lighter, more affordable with an enclosed battery. Claris HD3 is unrivaled for image quality in a handheld wireless ultrasound. It shows you the fine details you need to quickly investigate an area of concern and make a fine, uh, confident diagnosis on the spot to either bring comfort to your expecting patient or to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with eight beam formers and 192 elements that deliver the image quality only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn, as easy to use as your mobile devices. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for high portability to scan patients anywhere they are at the bedside. You get free movement with no wires, also making it so much faster to clean and disinfect. Claris is equipped with liquid cooling and an optional fan to keep the scanner cool for longer examinations. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners that come with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS and Android devices with free updates. Available with our new membership, Claris Cloud is available to capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. We also offer in-app Claris classroom videos with experts and onboarding with Claris clinicians to bring your ultrasounds to build your ultrasound scanning skills and to learn how to use the devices. Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. And the new advanced OB package provides additional flexibility with additional tools for more advanced obstetrical scanning and to streamline workflows and reporting, including the new labor and delivery preset that optimizes imaging during labor with tools like angle of progression. So again, very innovative features available with, with the scanners and the new advanced package. For clinicians who prefer a one-time purchase over a membership, the advanced OB package is also available as an add-on purchase. Ultra-affordable Clarius HD3 scanners deliver the performance of traditional systems at a fraction of the cost. I'd like to also tell you about Act One. So with your membership, you get the advanced OB package, as well as the Claris scanner, which comes with our redesigned Act One to automatically create a free animated video from the images and cine loops that you select from your exam. As you see here, what a cute video. Simply ask your patient for their email and consent and the Claris app will email your patients a link to the heartwarming movie that, that we just showed you. Act one is of course HIPAA and GDPR compliant. It's so much faster than using CDs, USBs and printing with zero cost to you. Expecting parents are delighted with the free keepsake and they love that it's all online and easy to access and share with family. I'll now give you five more seconds to complete the poll as we close it out. Four, three, two, one. We can now open up uh, to our Q and A session. I'd like to welcome back Dr. DeHawk and Shelley. Uh, please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. And since this is a common question, I'll be happy to answer it. I do want to let you all know that in the coming days, we'll email your recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF copy of the presentation. Now on to your questions. Shelley, can I invite you to moderate, please? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Janice. Um, hey, we have quite a few questions, a wide variety of topics. <laughs> um, uh, I have several questions regarding billing, and I know this is very difficult to answer on a general 
um, in general terms, but Dr. DeHock, um, one of the one of the questions is how does how does billing work for POCUS and is the same billing and reimbursement as a regular ultrasound? Um, I think this will depend on where you work. Um, I work in a publicly funded healthcare system, so our our billing is fee for service. Um, and ultrasound is only reimbursed in very specific circumstances for formal ultrasound. So um, we are unable to bill for POCUS where I work, but I am sure that this is very different depending on your region. That definitely differs by region. What we'll do is we'll follow up with the person who asked this question after the webinar. We'll help you better understand um, reimbursement for your region. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, patient position. So uh, you said to place a uh, patient uh, supine. Do you not raise the mother's uh, on the mother's right side to prevent uh, or aortic cable compression? Yeah, so if, if the mother's uncomfortable lying on her back, you could either put a little wedge um, on the back to rotate her a little bit towards you, or you can elevate the head slightly, certainly. Usually I'm doing a limited scan, so they're not on their back for very long. Yeah. And that, yeah, and I, I find too, like if I'm doing, you know, a, a detailed ultrasound or something like that, I'll, and, and she's quite far along, I, I will definitely tell her, look, this may happen. If it happens, don't wait too long and just, just let me know. And then we can, we can roll you on your side a little bit. It's very helpful. What does high drops look like in the second or third trimester? So, so some features of high drops um, would be polyhydramnios. You could get a pericardial effusion. Um, you can get edema under the fetal skin. Um, certainly, if you were suspicious of high drops, then you'd be obtaining a formal ultrasound. That was another billing question. Um, this, uh, I think, this question is more to do just with gaining it, um, lots of experience. But it says I have, I tend to have difficulty figuring out what body part I'm looking at. So the information about what the white line of the cranium was good, any other tips like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just... yeah, so, so bones tend to be bright and white um, and the fluid tends to be black, dark. Um, and I think, you know, if you're able to scan a little bit with somebody who's experienced, like I find it real, found I've learned a lot scanning with Shelly just in the course of a few hours, um, just sit with somebody who's, who's um, an experienced scanner. And I think you could pick up a lot very quickly. Yeah, I just find it's just repetition and uh, like anything, pattern recognition. And the more you do, the better, the more you'll recognize. How do we find where the cervical os is to determine if the placenta is low lying? Yeah, so when you're scanning transabdominally, you can usually locate the internal os of the cervix. You can usually see like a little diagonal line where the cervix external and internal os are. Um, and then you're measuring from the internal os. By far the best way to determine the position of the placenta from the os would be a transvaginal ultrasound, but usually you can get a fairly good sense transabdominally. Do you ever have your patients come in with a full bladder if there's question of, of um, low-lying placenta? I yeah, guess that it's would hard when you're, it yeah. would certainly be helpful, but usually usually it's during their routine visit. Um, yeah. um, so that's a little bit hard to plan for, but um, that, that is helpful. Basically, what can you say are the limitations or disadvantages of POCUS if there are any? Yeah, I think it has tremendous advantages in regards to um, the exam that we talked about today. So limited bedside scan, I don't think it replaces a formal conventional ultrasound. Um, I think that it uh, gives you very timely, timely answers. Um, and if concern is raised, then you can uh, arrange the appropriate follow-up uh, for the patient. The next question is just, just kind of about measuring technique. Um, I could probably answer this. Why outer to inner skull? <laughs> um, yeah, and I, we, that is we, just based, yeah, based on- We the, talked the, about this a little bit and we realized that this also is uh, varies from region to region. Yes, yeah. So between Europe and Canada and the United States, the technique is different for the BPD. Which I didn't realize until yesterday when I was looking into that. So mm -hmm. yeah, 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 so, it's so I mean, interesting. The, yeah, the growth charts that we use here, um, you know, that's that's how we do it. And that's how the, I would say the majority of countries and growth charts are. But yeah, definitely, uh, I believe in the UK, it's outer to outer. So you really have to um, just kind of determine uh, what are the, what, what's what's the local growth chart that everyone is using and, and go with that. Mm -hmm. 
is fetal Doppler available with the Clarius HD3? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> when baby's head is very low, what do you do to get accurate BPD and head circumference? Well, so a couple of tricks you can try is placing the patient in Trendelenburg to see if you can get the head elevated out of the pe uh, pelvis um, or waiting for the maternal bladder to fill a little bit sometimes can help. Sending the patient for a walk, hoping that baby's in a better position when they come back. And sometimes you just can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah, and it's I think, just challenging. I think often in the third trimester, especially the late third trimester, we don't re rely much on BPD measurements anymore because we know the head is wedged into the pelvis. We have a question about membership, but maybe we can kind of answer that one offline, uh, but we will get back to you. Um, and standards for calculating gestational age. Again, it's just a depends on which growth charts that you're using and, and the format, you know, per your um, institution. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the common indications of POCUS? Um, I think you just discovered that. Yeah, or, yeah I think we, yeah, I think we covered, well. yeah. Covered, yeah. covered that. I mean, if, if you had any further questions, questions around that, uh, maybe clarify. But I think what I what we reviewed today is really what I find to be the most practical and useful in the office. Great. Yeah. And certainly there are some, um, there's a lot of utility outside of the third trimester, which we didn't cover. So first trimester or even some gynae applications that we use right. focus for. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, different product questions in here and those we will definitely be, it'll be easier to answer uh, kind of offline where we can give you a, a better response to your questions. We've yeah, got we've got nearly fifty questions here, so it's it's quite a uh, challenge to read through them all. <laughs> yeah, sure yeah, it is. There's duplicate questions for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One person asked, "What's the difference between holding the scanner trans transverse or at ninety degrees?" Yeah, I guess depending on what. I think that's the same thing. So if you call yeah. the maternal midline, um, transverse is holding your transducer. That's yeah, 90 like, degrees. <laughs> yeah, like looking, to, like looking in an <laughs> looking in an axial plane more so, right? Yeah, um, yeah. For Just the patient to versus remember so. my junior high math. That's 90. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the same thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just providing it's just providing a different slice through through the anatomy that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. In twins pregnancy, in monochorionic and diamniotic, how do you measure the AFI uh, at 20 to 25 weeks? Yeah, good question. I don't know actually what the what the standard is for that. So the mono die twins would of course get a formal ultrasound um, every two weeks where we yeah. are. Okay, I can I can look into that and then respond mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah. So monochorionic uh, diamni if they're diamniotic, they would have separate sacs. You would do it separate the same sacs. way. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. We have a yeah. question here where, where someone's wondering if they can use their own iPad with the Claris. And the answer is absolutely yes. And mm -hmm. so uh, our scanners do work with um, Android and Apple devices, both uh, smartphones and tablets. And so if you have, uh, whether you have a phone or a tablet, you, you will be able to go ahead and, and synchronize uh, with your Claris scanner. Mm -hmm. And it's an instant uh, direct Wi-Fi connection between the two scanners. So you do not need a, a Wi-Fi network for the scanner to connect to the iPad. Mm -hmm. And it's just an app that you download on your phone or your iPad. It's very easy. And then the, they recognize each other. Yeah, Dr. Dehawk, how long did it take you to, to learn how to use the scanner? Yeah, it was pretty quick. To be honest, I didn't read much in regards to manual. So it was just sort of uh, by doing and um, downloaded the app. I found it quite straightforward and the connection's been good. Um, and then eventually in our office, we got an iPad on a stand. Um, and again, just downloading the app um, and then connecting quite seamlessly. And I, I find it actually pretty intuitive to use. So if you're not sure, you can have a look around at the buttons and usually figure out what I need to do. Uh, there's a question about the scanner um, itself. It says, aside from the weight, is there a significant difference between the Clarius version two and three? Um, so yeah, besides the weight, it's definitely smaller. Um, it's about the size of an iPhone. Um, so it's not um, as top heavy as, as the previous version. I find it much easier to scan with for longer periods of time. Um, image quality is, I, I find 
better um, with the version three. And there are new features as well available on the latest app. And some of the advanced features that I showed um, like the HD Zoom, um, we have um, some other features, not necessarily with OB, but um, uh, other more advanced features that we're seeing on big cart based systems as well. Um, and we're always adding more. So, so yeah, I would say there's a significant difference between, between two and three. We have some questions around IUD, um, IUDs. Dr. Hawk, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you use your Clarius ultrasound uh, mm -hmm. around the IUD procedures. I uh, do use the Clarius to identify the IUD. So it, it um, is a little more challenging transabdominally, but usually um, I can find the IUD in the fundus and confirm that the IUD is well-placed. So if I have a, a difficult IUD insertion, or if I have a patient come back for an IUD check and I can't see the strings on a speculum exam, um, I'll put the um, ultrasound probe on to see if I can see it abdominally. And if I'm able to reassure myself that way, then I don't need to get a formal scan. So that's nice. There's a question here about the requirements of um, endocavitary probe usage and do we need to sanitize it in a special manner or just condom usage is enough? Where we live, we have very, very strict standards um, with high level disinfectant in between patients as well as a condom. So I think it's very um, institution, institution dependent. Um, everybody will have their own rules and regulations. Uh, so that's something that you definitely have to check with um, with your facility or if, if you're in a facility, um, yeah, check, check what the regulations are with that. Mm -hmm. But the, the, but it's great. It's easy to clean the probe. It can be totally submersed. Um, you know, it, it's a great product for that. And you're not having to worry about the cord because there's no cord. So yeah, I find it much easier to clean and less to worry about. So there's a question here, Shelley, that maybe you can answer about uh, uploading images into the electronic me medical record system. So maybe yeah. you could talk a bit about, you, you, saw, you showed us some beautiful reports today. Mm -hmm. um, how do we save those reports? What are the options? Yeah, so, so the images can be um, uploaded to the Clarius Cloud. They can be saved on the device itself, or they can be sent by in DICOM format to a, um, to a hospital uh, network. Um, there's all kinds of options, everything that you need as well for, um, we can upload the reports in a PDF and send them to an EMR as well. So there's a lot of options available um, that, that, you know, one of those should be able to suit, suit the needs of, of, um, of the user. One person asked about whether telemedicine is a new feature or was it available on version two? That is available on version two. So if you're using our HD scanners today, um, the telemedicine feature is there and it looks like a little phone icon on the top right of, the, of, the, of your device. I encourage you to try it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, there's a few questions about Doppler, and I will um, I will do my best to answer those offline. They, they require a little bit bigger of a of a response, so I will do that later. I feel I would need a little more training. How much hands-on training is there, Dr. Dehock? What, what was your experience with training? So we had a rep come to our office and do a demo, and they did offer to come back to do some um, hands-on training or do some hands-on training the day they were there for the demo. Um, in our office, we've been using um, um, older cart-based um, bedside ultrasound before we um, switched to Claria. So most of us were felt fairly comfortable with um, doing bedside ultrasound at that point. So we didn't take advantage of the um, formal training, but it was offered to us. Great. Yeah, so, so when your scanner arrives, you're encouraged to set up a one hour in service um, as we walk you through how to use the device um, and adjust things like depth and gain and to set up the device with your uh, preferences in mind. Um, and then there are also uh, Clarice classroom videos available um, so that you can see fellow um, obstetricians who have uh, provided a variety of different exams. We have them for both first, second and third trimester exams and they're available in apt or as well, they're available in our Claris classroom on our website. Uh, I invite you to check it out so you can go and see uh, that high definition imaging and what it looks like. Great. Well, I think we're just about at the top of the hour. So um, we are. Cool. Thank you so yeah. much, uh, Dr. DeHawk and Shelley. Um, 
if we there, there were quite a number of questions today we have a, a lovely lively audience very engaged it's lovely to have you all here if we didn't get to your question we will follow up with you by email in the coming week to learn more we do invite you to visit clarius.com classroom for short focus video tutorials for obstetrics um, and gynecology i'd like to um, offer a huge thank you to both dr de hawk and shelly thank you as well to all of you for joining us here today Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Keep scanning.